Good morning, friends. Good morning. It's so good to see all of you here. Welcome. I'm Althea Brooks, and I'm Senior Director of Lifetime Learning in the Office of Engagement. And we plan this program with our partners, the Alumni Association. Uh, more than the score has been in inception since uh, uh, 2006, so a very, very long time. Um, so again, welcome. We also extend a warm welcome to our at-home audience viewing. There's about uh, 2,400 or so viewing us uh, from home today. We have two remaining more than the score lectures. Can everyone hear me okay back there? I think I just destroyed this. Sorry about that. We have two remaining more than the score lectures prepared for you this fall. I hope you will register and attend. We also have a number of lifetime learning uh, online resources as well as webinars uh, this fall. And uh, we, we invite you to register and attend those. Visit our website at engagement.virginia.edu backslash learn. Uh, before we begin, go ahead and silence the ringer on your phone. And please hold your questions to the end. Mr. Sabato loves, loves questions, and he will take as many questions as possible at the end of his presentation. But we ask you to ask just one brief question. Hold those comments. Just a question. Thank you. Now we're thrilled to welcome Larry. Larry is the only faculty at UVA who has spoken at more than the score every year for the last 18 years. That in itself deserves an applause. All right, let me briefly introduce a man that does not need introduction. Larry J. Sabato has won four Emmys and is recognized as one of the nation's most respected political analysts. He appears on national and international television networks multiple times a week, including CNN, CNN International, and BBC. He is a Rhodes Scholar. Sabato is the founder and director of the University of Virginia's Center for Politics. He has taught over 20,000 students. <laughs> 20,000 students in his career at the University of Virginia and has given, and the university has given it, him his, our highest honor, which is the Thomas Jefferson Award. Mr. Sabato is celebrating his 53rd year with, in association with the University of Virginia. He is a New York Times best-selling author, having authored or edited over two dozen books on American politics. Uh, Sabato is the editor and lead author of the newly released book, The Red Ripple, The 2022 Midterm Elections and What They Mean for 2024. And the bookstore is over here selling his books. Larry Sabato's books make very, very good Christmas gifts. We invite you to buy a few for your friends. Use it again. <laughs> Thank you for being here, Mr. Sabato. Sabato. Thank you for speaking with more than the score again this year. Please help me welcome Larry Sabato. That's great. And Althea's done a terrific job with more than the score. I, I'm, she's too young to have been here for the 18 years. Uh, I don't know how many years, but it's been a while, you know. So uh, give her a round of applause. <laughs> well, it's nice to be back. Some of you I only see at these events, so it's a good reason for coming. And I was able to mix with some of you, and I think you were impressed. I remembered every single name. I'm very proud of that. Of course, uh, luckily for me, you're all named Buddy. Uh, and that will, so if I call you Buddy, you'll know I know you. You know, I know you. And really, you do remember people, and may, sometimes you get the first name right, and sometimes the last name right, and sometimes no name right. So bu Buddy works, thank goodness. There was a... Um, old uh, U.S. Senator from West Virginia, not Byrd, the other, the other one that was in there for decades, uh, Jennings Randolph, if anybody's from West Virginia remembers Jennings Randolph, though he's been out for ages. But uh, he had a great technique for trying to connect with people he should know or used to or they think they, that he knows them or whatever. And he said, as long as they're over 50, I'm fine because 
while I'm shaking their hand, I say, how's that back problem? <laughs> because almost everybody over, and then if they said, well, I don't have a back problem, you say, oh, who was it in your family that had a back problem? Who doesn't have a family with people in it who have back problems? So there are all these little techniques, all of them phony, but I just wanted you to know, and that's politics, you know, big dose of phoniness, uh, but good things too, good things too. Um, I, gotta, I gotta mention, gluttons for punishment. I've got Evan over here. I've, these two are sitting up front for a change. Uh, for my, they're all in my current class, and there are probably others here, and you can come up later. And then these two, okay, where are you? Yeah, those, they're there. They're ninth graders in Richmond, and they came to hear this, to hear this address. So, so this will make sure they go to another school. After they see it, they'll say, well, that's, you know, no way am I going through four years of that. Uh, but we hope you come. They told me they're coming, and I told them that it was legally binding because I had witnesses. So I hope admissions will agree. Uh, okay, look, uh, one of the great things about having been around for a while, or really having followed politics for a while, or even being old, is that uh, you can remember so many things that relate to whatever's happening today. You know, when you're young, you think everything's happened for the first time, right? That's the way we all did. But there are always precedents, there are always comparisons uh, to be made, similarities and differences. And when I woke up this morning, and of course the top news, or actually the only news on a couple of the news stations, are about the conflict in the Middle East. Who would have believed there's a conflict in the Middle East? But, and we hope things turn out well and that it's short and all the rest of it for lots of reasons because the last thing we want is for that to spread. Uh, but uh, Hamas attacked Israel and, and uh, the Israeli intelligence, Mossad, which is usually very good, very good. Uh, they, they just utterly failed. Uh, there was not, the, not an inkling that this massive attack was coming, and it, and it has been massive in terms of rockets and also street to street and door to door and all the rest of it in cer certain places. And what it, and listening to them, of course, the anchors have got various Israeli officials there, and they start out with, how did you fail to see this coming? What, you know, what are you going to do about this? How are you going to reform your intelligence services? It just happened a few hours ago. You know, they're going to have a commission to study it. That's what always happens in these things. And they get better after they make mistakes. That's, that's the excuse I give to us, too. But it reminded, they kept saying, this is Israel's 9-11. This is Israel's 9-11. Not really. You know what it reminded me of? The Tet Offensive. Because I think Israel will win in the end. They're bound to, uh, and so at least mainly they will win. Militarily, Militarily yeah. We're not, don't, don't question me, sir. <laughs> this is, if you were in class, you'd already have an F. <laughs> I'm kidding. I, lo I love the questions that always come from this group. But um, they, were, uh, they were questioning them about that. And it reminded me of the Tet Offensive, which the U.S. won. Remember the Tet Offensive in January of 1968 uh, was uh, an unexpected attack from both uh, North Vietnamese troops and Viet Cong troops on most of our bases and installations and major cities in Vietnam. And we had been told for really years, but especially the months before Tet, we see the light at the end of the tunnel. Remember that? We see the light at the end of the tunnel. And it turned out to be an onrushing train. Uh, and that was unfortunately what happened there. But we won. We actually uh, won the Tet Offensive because all the attacks were repelled. And while I don't like to talk about people getting killed, but it was a massive number of Viet Cong and Vietnamese soldiers. Uh, but because it was such an intelligence failure, it was judged to have been a failure of the United States, whatever happened militarily. And you remember Walter Cronkite going, I, I, these young people have no idea what I'm talking about. But, you know, and this is just a hint of what's to come, you know, both here and later when you go to college. Uh, but uh, Walter Cronkite went to Vietnam, remember, with the soldier's helmet on, and he said, uh, uh, we, uh, we've done our best. We are good people who tried to help. 
And uh, now we need to negotiate a settlement because we're never going to win this thing. I'm summarizing what he said. It was Walter Cronkite, the most trusted man in America. And he did show up that way in the Gallup polls, and he was very authoritative. Who can imitate that voice? It was very, very authoritative. Um, but we never got the full story because by the time it was clear that we had won, we'd moved on to 10 other things, which, is, which was bad then, and it's far worse now. Can you imagine fighting any war from World War II with social media, Twitter? Well, we've lost. We might as well get out. You know, there's no way we're going to beat Hitler anyway. I mean, that's what would have happened every time we had a setback. So uh, they're lucky they didn't have social media, but we have it. And uh, we have to live with it. I don't think we'll ever, we'll ever uh, figure out how to reform it, just like we're now worried about AI and I wonder how we're going to control that. Can we even believe any of the images we're seeing? Because it's so real life. One of my staffers studies AI, and it's just frightening how, how real it is. And you, you don't get any hints that it's really not the person. If it's well done, there's some AI stuff that's terrible. But they're getting better and better and better. And once they finish that, it's all a matter of machine learning, then they will take over the earth, you know, like the Terminator. That's what's come, that's the second stage, but I'll be dead, many of you will too. So, uh, no need to worry, no need, no, you kids, you young, I should say young people, good luck. That's all I want to say to you, good luck. And then, you know, my generation, most of us, we've done a great job. We, we solved the climate problem, there's no gun violence. Uh, I could go right down the list. I don't, you know, you have it so much better than we did. Am I not right, older people? Okay, they can't. See, we have an honor system. They can't lie. And I'm just testing to see if you still believed in the honor system, and you do. All right, look, we're just, I'm going to run through this because I really enjoy the questioning, and I'm going to keep it, keep it short. I'm just going to do a few um, projections for 2024. Uh, you know, that, what I'm saying in this graph is, the, on the left, all the safe Republican seats a large, large majority of what they've got now. So all those safe Democratic seats, a large, large majority of what they've got now. And you can see all the competitive categories are between those two big red and blue bars. There are almost none of them. So as usual, we're going to have this football game between the 40 and 60. That's where the game is going to be fought. And that's not good for the country. It's not good for all of us. It's terrible we don't have more competitive elections. But that's the reality, and I don't see it changing anytime soon. And, you know, how can you have a favorite when you've got a five-seat majority, just like the Democrats had a five-seat majority in the previous Congress? You can't really call a favorite until you know who the nominees for president are. And, yes, we'll get into that. Okay, Senate. Uh, you know, I tend to think these things will end up probably going in the direction of the presidential race. And if there's an exception, it'll be the Senate because it's so idiosyncratic and you have to look at the individual seats and only a third of them are up. And, uh, and so this is one that, <laughs> look at the map. And uh, if you can summarize all those colors. And I made my staff simplify it. You should have seen it before I made them simplify this. Uh, but everything that's red in any shade uh, is a Republican seat that is currently leaning or, or uh, solid Republican or safe Republican. And the only two Democrats could even begin to contest seriously, Texas and Florida. And neither one of them, I, and they'll get, unless something you know, massively drastic happens to um, Rick Scott or, or Ted Cruz. And you know, Democrats can get it close, as they proved with Ted Cruz the last time, but uh, every election, you know, you see all these articles, Texas is turning blue, or Texas is competitive now, and then the Republicans are elected. Well, that's not what I call competitive. I'll believe it's competitive when I see Democrats winning some offices statewide. They have nothing. They have nothing. They haven't had anything at all since, I think, 1994, anything big. Uh, so uh, in Florida, you know, I think we got a pretty good hint of where Florida has gone in uh, in both 2020 and 2022. Uh, now, for Democrats, it's a very different situation. Remember, it's 51-49, 51, 51 Democratic, 49 Republican. Yeah, that's right. They filled, they filled Dianne Feinstein's seat, so it's 51-49. Uh, the blue states, obviously, many of them are, are safe. 
Others are, you know, a little bit competitive. Nevada, I could see switching under the right set of circumstances. Wisconsin, maybe, not, not so much. Michigan, not so much. Pennsylvania, it's hard to beat a Casey in Pennsylvania. You know, they've, they've won for so many years. His father was governor for two terms, and, and the son here, uh, this will be, I guess, his third, third term, running for a third term. Uh, so I doubt it, you know, but I'm putting it on there because we've got 13 months to go. But the ones that will determine the majority in the Senate are the three toss-up states, Arizona, because it's a three-way race, and I, I don't even have an early prediction for that. It's, you can't handicap it because you don't know for sure who's running. Now, if the Republicans actually follow up and nominate Carrie Lake again, and she's currently leading in both the private and public polls, She's the one, you know, who won the, gov won the governorship. She did not win the governorship. Uh, she's ultra, she's worse than Trump. It's ultra Trump. Everything's, everything is voter fraud, voter fraud, voter fraud. No, sorry about that. Uh, but she could win a three-way race. You know, you never know how those things are going to break. Uh, so I don't want to even think about that. Montana, you've got uh, a Democrat who narrowly wins and has had the right set of circumstances repeatedly, but you, again, you never know. It's a 60% Republican state. It's a presidential year. That would require a lot of people to split ticket and not that many split ticket anymore. Anywhere. They just don't split ticket. Uh, so in that sense, it's easier to predict, but not really. And Ohio, uh, Sherrod Brown, again, Ohio used to be the ultimate bellwether. In fact, one of our Crystal Ball staffers uh, wrote a book about the bellwether, and it was a bellwether when he wrote it, and now he can't get a second edition. It's just, it's gone, <laughs> because uh, Iowa and Ohio have turned substantially Republican, and I think they'll stay there for a while. You never want to predict too far in advance. You don't know what's going to happen, but uh, starting with Trump in, in 2016, they're now substantially Republican, and other states became more Democratic, like Virginia, but not just Virginia. Um, so that one's, we don't know who the Republican nominee is yet. They've got a big primary, so we'll see. The one that I, I just can't imagine the Democrat winning is Joe Manchin in West Virginia, which is why he's considering all these other options. But he's the last statewide Democrat in any major office in West Virginia. And when some of us were growing up, that was about the first state called because it was automatically Democratic by big margins. So you didn't have to wait very long to call it. Well, now it's heavily Republican. Again, uh, well, it really started with Bush, uh, Bush uh, 43 in 2000. He used abortion and, uh, and guns to, to beat Al Gore uh, there. And if Gore just won West Virginia, you know, heavily Democratic state, he would have been president. But he lost some of the Democratic base. And they've become so, so Republican. I think whoever's nominated by the Republicans will probably get the seat and the current Republican governor's running. And so I think that's a plus one for Republicans, very, very likely. Well, that would be enough to tie it right there, assuming all the Democrats won and all the other Republicans won. But I, I think it'll go beyond that. So the odds are Republicans will take control of the Senate after the 2024 election. But let's go back to 2022. The odds were even heavier that the Republicans would take control of the Senate in 2022. And then they nominated some very odd candidates here and there, and they, they lost. One right after another, they lost. Now, they're trying to nominate better candidates because it's being run from the Senatorial Committee in Washington rather than leaving it to unusual people uh, in, in some of these states. So I think they have a better chance. But if you, if you know Mitch McConnell or you run into him, don't get him started on how many times Republicans should have won the Senate and blew it with bad nominees. It goes way, way back. It goes way, way back. So in any event, I think, you know, you have to lean that to the Republicans, and we'll see. We'll see who's the, who the two nominees for president are. That will have some impact, but less because it's only a third of the seats. And Democrats just don't have any targets. Well, we have to get on to the presidency, and I'm sorry about this. I really, I really am. I'm very, very sorry about this. And uh, that's okay. My students do that 10 times a class. It's, I've learned to totally ignore buzzes. does not bother me at all. Later, I flunk them, you know, just, just so you know. I, I mean, I'm Italian-American. I am vindictive. I, 
I am vindictive. Sir, that over there, I'm just letting you know, okay? I'm le- but I'm, I'm kinder than my Uncle Vito, my great Uncle Vito, who actually was in the mafia in Sicily. He came over in 19, I think it was 1915, uh, and he's long dead. He's long dead, but we got a lot of great stories, which I will not tell you. Um, but it's great to use with students. It really instills fear in them. You know, and they all go and watch the Godfather films. And I tell them my family was different. It was a, a mild segment of the mafia. We simply break kneecaps. We do not kill. It's just thou shalt not kill. We believe in that. Okay. And you're not laughing, but it's really true. Okay. So, look, there, who's at the toe? Who's that red line at the top? Every time he gets indicted, yes, he either goes up or stays stable. Now, whether that will continue, I don't expect any other indictments, but there are 91 counts. You know, the odds are he will be found guilty of a certain number of them, um, and we'll see about the appeals and all the rest of it, and whether it can be done before the Republican convention or before the November general election. And even uh, even if they are not done, they'll have some impact. How much depends on the health of both of the nominees and some other factors that I'll discuss in a moment. But I don't even think Trump is an absolute lock to get the nomination the way you'd think if you watched much television. We haven't had a single vote cast. Lots of things can happen. You know, particularly when one guy is 77 and the other guy is 80. You know, and I wish everybody long life. I I wish that ever more fervently each year. I really do. I I think the average age in America should be 100. And keep going up. Every year should go up by one year. That's the way I look at it. But uh, a lot of things can still happen. But he's beyond the person to beat for the nomination. It's it's gonna take not a miracle, but a, a combination of dramatic events that we probably couldn't imagine. Uh, or if we imagined them, we would uh, be called participating in fantasy politics, and I really don't want to do that. Uh, DeSantis is the green line, you know, down, down, down. Um, this is a classic example of, of somebody who would have been better off <clears throat> going to Bermuda for the election uh, and, you know, and tele- teleporting his, uh, his thoughts. Uh, from there, uh, he just doesn't, he doesn't come across well, he doesn't mix well with people. I saw this once in a, in a um, fundraising gathering, and it was a gathering mainly of billionaires and hundred millionaires. In other words, the Yunkin base. Um, <laughs> and DeSantis, <laughs> DeSantis was at the door, and he was waiting for a panel to finish. I happened to be on the panel, so I, I uh, watched this, I, I couldn't, avoid him, he was right in front of me. The panel ended, and I'm telling you, DeSantis should be entered in the Olympics. He will win any race that he runs. Uh, He would have walked over both grandmothers to get to the richest person in the room who was on the panel. Uh, And he he did, he ignored people. People were reaching out for him, he ignored them because they weren't worth what this person was worth. I know how important money is, but you know you can do it in a nicer way. You have to be able, you have to be able to carry on small talk with people, which he's terrible at. Uh, you also have to really like people, honestly, genuinely like people. You have to be sincere about it. And if you can fake that, you can win anything. That was a joke. You know better than to not laugh, okay? It's gonna cost you two, for sure. I, did, I saw Evan laughing, thank you, Evan. Uh, the other ones, I can't even distinguish the lines. They're, they're all down there together, though I still think Nikki Haley has, has a shot. Uh, she would be the most likely uh, at this point to, uh, to uh, find a way to get a coalition maybe to beat, uh, to beat Trump in, uh, in uh, Iowa and New Hampshire. And it is interesting. Those are the two states that like Trump the least in the entire first half of the nominating process. And they're the two first ones. So if Trump ended up losing, even one of them, I think it would turn into a real contest. If he loses both, he'll lose a lot of altitude fast. Because there are are a lot of Republicans out there who are going along with the crowd, and they've already voted for him twice, at least twice, not counting primaries. And uh, so they're inclined toward him. But they also recognize, uh, as they keep saying uh, when you interview them, well, he has a lot of baggage. Yeah, you could say that. Enough for a 747. 
Uh, a lot of baggage there. Uh, they might go to somebody else. I thought Tim Scott would be that person originally, but he just he hasn't connected, even though he's a, he's a nice guy, and I think in small gatherings he's better than he is on the, uh, on the stage. The other ones, you know, I admire Chris Christie. I've liked Chris Christie for a long time, because Chris Christie will tell you exactly what he thinks, and thinks, and thinks, and thinks. Uh, but you know, he knows he's not going to be the nominee. He knows what he's saying is incredibly unpopular, but he says it anyway because he thinks Donald Trump would be a disaster in the in the Oval Office. I don't know why he thinks that, uh, but he thinks Trump would be a disaster. But he has no chance. We have a better chance of entering as a write-in and managing to win. And I would not advise that of any of you because it's not a good place to be. And the the other ones, you know, what what possesses the governor of North Dakota? to run for president, other than being worth hundreds of millions of dollars and wanting to burn some of it away. That's got to be the motivation. You know, I have a center he could donate to. I, we would have put that money to good use, but he did not ask me. I would have told him to do that. Uh, he's a nice guy. Again, nice guy. You know, what in the heck is that all about? So um, we can talk about him further if you want in the question period. Uh, these are the early states that ought to determine the nominee, although sometimes it goes all the way to June, occasionally it goes all the way to June. The uh, orange states are Super Tuesday on March 5th, and you would think probably we would have a very good idea of who the nominee was going to be in the, on the Republican side. The Democratic side is not a race, no matter what you think, um, by uh, March 5th, after or Mar the evening of March 5th, or maybe March 6th, depending on who's counting the ballots. Um, New Hampshire, we still don't know which day it's going to be. They keep playing games with Iowa and others, and they'll eventually pick a date, and they can do so uh, with very little warning. So that's how they maintain their first-in-the-nation status. Iowa's finally given up, admitted that they're not going to be first anymore because the Democrats don't want them, and the Republicans aren't too sure about them being first either. So it's, it's not going to happen. Now, for, for the Republicans, it may happen. For the Democrats, they're gone. Iowa's gone. They're not losing anything. They, the electoral votes are, are gone to the Republicans for the foreseeable future. So they don't lose anything uh, by replacing uh, Iowa in the lineup. And so um, that starts January 15th. I think the Iowa date will, will hold. And I've been hoping that that would hold because if New Hampshire decides it wants to go first, we're going to be back to January 2nd again. Uh, I would like to spend my holidays someplace else uh, than uh, New Hampshire and Iowa. They, ten they tend, to be Iowa, tend to be snowy at that time, but that was before climate change, so maybe that's, that's going to change too. All right, quickly, the Electoral College ratings. Um, this, is, this is, you know, we're, we're not guessing about 40 to 44 of these states, uh, certainly 40, probably 42, are over before they start, as long as it's a competitive race and somebody doesn't um, dissolve for one reason or another. Uh, it's predictable. It's too predictable. It's disturbingly predictable. We need more competition. We're not going to get it for the foreseeable future. All the red states in various uh, colors there are going to vote Republican, and that gives them an automatic total of 235. All the, the blue states there uh, in dark blue, uh, the, the lighter blue ones we can talk about, um, but it gives them, if they carry those, 260. I tend to think their firm total is more like 240, somewhere in that vicinity for this race. And then the toss-ups at a minimum are 43, and there are four that both sides agree on that nobody uh, can count on under any circumstances, and that's Arizona, Nevada, Wisconsin, and Georgia. And the, it's the combination of their demographics at this point and their party IDs that make those states incredibly competitive. So both states, both of the uh, major campaigns will spend millions and millions, what did I say millions, probably billions, the way things are going, uh, in those states, not just with advertising, but voter contact. I would not want to live in one of those states. Uh, because you, unless you can turn off all your calls and not miss anybody, like the bill collectors, uh, the, it's just and every every TV. I guess there are ways of cutting out the commercials now, right? I'm I'm still I've got a Motorola Color from the mid '60s, and it still works. I'm not going to replace it. It's a sentimental value, you know. At that age, I, I watched Walter. I mean, um, yeah, Walt Disney's uh, Wonderful World of Color. You know, that's very sentimental to me. 
Uh, so nobody's going to take that Motorola away from me. Um, but, uh, you know, there you go. And it's going to be highly competitive. Uh, one assumes as long as you have two nominees who can actually win, and lots of things can happen. Now, the issues are, are obvious to anybody. For the Re Republicans, they're going to focus on these five things. Biden's performance, which especially on, on the economy, and yep, lots of the statistics suggest the economy's improving and blah, 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 blah. But people have to believe it. You know, they have to believe it. They have to think they're, in Ronald Reagan's phrase, as you turn to Jimmy Carter, are you better off today than you were four years ago? And, and most people in the key state, the key states, have to answer yes. You can still win the states leaning to your party, even if they answer no. But in those other states, you have to answer yes. We'll see, you know, and you, you, every other day I see a well-known economist saying, it's, we're going to have a recession, or we're going to have a soft landing. Or, I wish they'd all get together. They're like meteorologists. You know, they constantly change their forecast, and they count on you not remembering what they said. And, of course, we don't because it's the dismal science. Nobody's going to focus on them. People love political analysts. That's who they focus on. <laughs> I'm having to drag that. I hope you're going to be livelier at the game. <laughs> so immigration is, you know, immigration has been a problem. The last time we even semi-solved it was when Reagan and Bill Bradley got together in 1986. Ever since then, it's been a problem. Once those reforms uh, deteriorated, uh, Bush tried. He came very, very close in his second term, but it just barely failed, uh, and I think we would have had a different situation had it passed. But whoever's incumbent is going to suffer from this because it's always a mess. It's always a mess. No matter what your rhetoric is and what your program is and whether you're building a wall or not, or I guess now both sides want to build a wall. Uh, I just want to know how much has Mexico paid? <laughs> what have they paid? Weren't we promised that they would? I thought so. Okay, immigration is there, and that's, that's big. Inflation, the economy, that directly relates to Biden performance. Uh, crime is, is clearly on the uptick in a lot of urban areas, and people pay attention. They watch the news, and half of it now is about this outrageous crime and this awful crime over there. These things have an impact, even if you, in your area the crime rate's dropping. The impression you get is, we are going to be in anarchy very, very soon, and we've got to do something about it. And both parties will, will debate that. But, you know, the combination, leave inflation to the side, as important as it is, because that can change. But immigration and crime uh, remind me so much of some of the elections in the past where Republicans have won when they weren't projected to win when the cycle began. It's a powerful, emotional combination. They're not necessarily related, but people conflate them uh, in their minds. So if Democrats are going to focus on anything that is correcting and trying to make it better, and that's what Biden's trying to do with building, building the wall or however, however many miles it is, uh, immigration and crime is what Republicans should focus on, and Democrats should try to, to deflate one way or another. I put Hunter Biden up because I'm sorry for those of you who think this is the most important issue uh, in Western civilization right now. It has no impact other than exciting Republicans. And if it weren't this, it'd be something else exciting them to turn out. This doesn't win you any undecided voters. Uh, it really doesn't. Because every president has had relatives, close relatives, who caused problems for them. You know, if you're, if you're in a family of somebody like Joe Biden or, you know, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, they've all had problems. Uh, you capitalize on your relative being president because you know you're never going to get to be president. And you resent that. He always dominates Thanksgiving, you know, and this is not fair. Um, so they do, they do things they shouldn't do and <laughs> with Hunter, Hunter Biden. If there's ever a book written about uh, role models for young people, he will not be in the index. <laughs> there's, there's no way he's going to be mentioned, uh, have, having read some of that stuff. But it doesn't change votes. Now, Democrats, <laughs> it's Trump, 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 Trump. And the longer he's in the public sphere, the more controversial things he says and does, and the more things that are uncover, uncovered. Now, it doesn't affect his base. We all know that. It doesn't affect most Republican identifiers. But elections today are determined by three to five percent. That's those are the only movables. 
the vast majority of you, and I don't have any idea what your individual party ID is, but the vast majority of you, no matter what you're saying today, you will vote your party ID. You will. You will. I'm ordering you. No. Uh, and that's what's going to happen. And then you have 3 to 5% who actually can go back and forth because party ID has become so strong, it predetermines most votes, even when people don't know the candidates who are running. Um, this area is having, uh, and all of Virginia is having an election for school boards and things. Look, most people don't know who these people are. I'm going to admit something to you. The other day I had my, had my uh, ballot, absentee ballot or whatever they're calling it these days, mail ballot. I always get that because I'm busy on election day. I think you could agree. That's a, kind of a busy day for me. And I was filling it out. And, you know, I, I do poll. That's all I do. That is all I do. It's, it's been a wasted life. Um, <laughs> And I'm going down the ballot, and I had no idea who these people were. I mean, beyond delegate. You know, I knew the Senate and delegate and that kind of thing. But I had no idea who was running for school board or who they were or what their positions were, clerk of court, these, these uh, positions. Now, fortunately, being a responsible voter, uh, I uh, went on the online and, you know, went to the websites and so on. No, that's a lie. I... <laughs> I did, and I asked my assistant if he knew who these people were, and he gave me a short summary, and I voted on that basis. It's so irresponsible. And I did that in order to tell you not to be irresponsible. Do not make the mistakes that I've made. But I'm, I'm sure it's okay, one way or the other. Um, so anyway, we got past the Trump. Uh, Roe v. Wade, obviously, that, that is a, an issue that's going to uh, play for Democrats for a long time to come, because every time you turn around, there's another horror story. And it doesn't affect the results in red states, although I must say, of the five red states that have had referenda, one sort or another, on uh, Dobbs, the Dobbs decision, uh, the uh, pro-choice side has won every single one of them, even in deep red states. And I think it's going to continue to be a problem of one degree or another, for Republicans, certainly in competitive states. You know, you can come up with all the formulations you want about how many weeks and that kind of thing. It doesn't change the fundamental. That is an enormously unpopular decision. Dobbs is already much more unpopular than Roe v. Wade ever was. See, you know, be careful. When the dog catches the mail truck, what does he do? You know, he doesn't know what to do. He's been chasing it for years. And he's thrilled to have caught it. And then, you know, he thinks, uh, what do I get for this? Uh, and it's the same with, with uh, abortion. Roe v. Wade uh, went the way of uh, pro-abortion uh, pro, uh, people, pro, uh, not pro-abortion, what am I trying to say? Pro-choice people, thank you, there's so many labels anymore. Uh, pro, I try to use the label that people want to use to describe their positions. I'm not going to get in an argument over the labels. So uh, the pro-choice side won, and they relaxed, you know, because they had what they wanted, and it was a Supreme Court decision, so obviously it would last forever, which is a terrible assumption to make. And the pro-life side said, we're going to reverse this. Sooner or later, we're going to reverse this. And whether you agree with them or not, you've got to give them credit. They went after it for 50 years, and they finally succeeded, day after day after day. And it motivated some people. That was a single thing they did, you know, and, and they got it done uh, through various means. And now the shoe's on the other foot. Now it's the pro-choice side that's outraged, and they want to reverse Roe v. Wade. So we'll see. We'll see what happens with Dobbs. It'll take a long time to reverse Dobbs because you've got to have the Supreme Court votes, and Democrats are not going to have those for a long time. So uh, the pro-life side can relax there, but where they can't relax is the effect it's having on elections. It also means the Democrats will have that issue for a long time, just like the pro-life community had that issue for a long time. Biden's record we've covered, Ukraine, uh, is not going to be a big issue unless American troops are involved. That's always true. Uh, we say we're concerned about international relations, and we are, and we can talk forever about China and Russia and this country and that country. Only when American troops are involved do you actually see votes switch. And I, I just study votes. That's it. You know, I love the sentiments. I'm glad you're interested, glad you're studying those critical issues, but they don't affect elections. Uh, and then the, uh, the, the Republicans have really opened themselves up uh, with, I don't know if you noticed, but last week there was, you know, a kerfuffle in uh, Congress. There is what has been termed, and I love this term, 
the crazy chaotic clown car uh, that is running the House of Representatives and to some degree the Republican Party in a lot of states. Now they're the tail wagging the dog in a lot of places, eight members wagging <laughs> the hundreds of other Republican members, but those are the rules and they decided to use them, including one of the eight, you know, represents Alumni Hall. <laughs> Uh, it represents this area, the very badly named Bob Good. Um, <laughs> and that's the problem. See, he got, he got elected with 2,500 votes in a convention that had one voting place, one voting place very, very near Liberty University where he worked, and that he beat Denver Riggleman, who was a, look at his record pretty much straight conservative voting, but he had done some bad things on, on social issues outside of Congress, and so they beat him. They beat him. And, and now Bob Good, and then they redistricted uh, by accident. It was the leftover pieces, frankly. That's how the district got uh, formulated the way it is. It's impossible to, to beat him except in a primary. Now, they can't do it. They love to have conventions. They want conventions because they can control conventions. They know how to do it. And just a small number of people participate. The uber activists come and show up for uh, conventions. But if they had a primary, then there would be a shot, at least, of uh, sending him out to pasture or back to Liberty University, as the case may be. But I don't think, I don't think it's going to happen. So he's there. And those of you who live in the fifth, whether you like him or not, you're stuck with him. And that's the way it's going to be. Okay, but the, the clown car image is really not helpful, and it's easy for Democrats to run against that because you just put the clips of all the crazy things that are said and done in Congress, and, and boom, you've got to, a decent chance of getting all your people out and maybe winning a few independents. All right, quickly, I don't have to tell you this, Biden approval rating. He, it really, the lines crossed during Afghanistan, the withdrawal from Afghanistan back in August of uh, his first year as president, 2021. And the red line there is disapproval, and you can see. And it's stabilized. That's the good news for Biden. The bad news is it's stabilized at mid-50s, unpopular or, or unfavorable, and, uh, and then 42% uh, or so uh, approve of his, of his job performance. But that, that's simply not very good, and it's not good enough to get reelected under the vast majority of circumstances. So they have to find some way uh, to improve things. By the way, I realized on that graph, we left out age. And uh, I, I am going to fire somebody uh, for doing that because age, age affects both of them. You know, it's, uh, 80, well, he'll be 82. Biden will be 82 and Trump will be 78 uh, while they're running. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, I never thought I'd see a 78-year-old called the spring chicken of the race. <laughs> This, we got to get back to nominating and electing people in their 50s and uh, low 60s. I don't care what your ideology is. You know, we need energy. Um, now, th there are exceptions. There are there are older people who do, I think, a, a terrific job. And uh, yeah, you better you better applaud. <laughs> See, everybody says I'm an exception to the rule. No, no, you got to give it up. Uh, so we got to put age on that. Where's Dave? Dave, age. I'm not going to fire you because you're here, all right? But somebody else is getting it. Final factor is the, the third-party candidates and independents. And this has changed since we did the, did the graph because Cornell West, he originally started as a nominee of the People's Party. And then he went to the Green Party and supposedly had that arranged. What are we doing? What are we doing? Stop. And now he's running as an independent. You think, well, what's the difference? He'll be on the ballot. No. Uh, the Green Party has access automatically to over 20 states, and the rest of them they can get on because they know how to do it. Uh, People's Party, less so. He, he would not have been on the ballot in a lot of places. And independent, he's got to do it all himself. So uh, this was very good news for Biden, even though Cornell West may still be on the ballot in some critical states. We'll have to see which ones he can, he can get on. But, you know, unusual fellow. I don't want to get into that. Um, RFK Jr. certainly wasn't going to beat Biden. No, no chance of beating him as a Democrat. And I don't even think in the end he would have gotten 10% or so. 
uh, of the Democratic vote, much less in the general. But now he's either going to run as an independent, and he's also talking about uh, running as a libertarian. He's been talking with them. I, I don't know, but I'll tell you what I've seen from the data I've been supplied privately is, amazingly, he's hurting Trump more than Biden. And it makes sense when you think about the fact that he is about as anti-vax as anybody you can find. And that's taking votes from Trump. Also, he has a lot of Republican backers. Steve Bannon is supplying some of his supporters and money and so on. I mean, I, I guess he's had another falling out with Trump. But he's attracting more potential Trump voters, not solid Republicans, but Trump voters who are independent and, and uh, non-college, you know, blue collars, that kind of thing. So that's very interesting to me. And by the way, just a little aside off the record, he's a nut. Uh, I'm just trying to summarize a lot of things so that you know that. And I, you know, I know a lot of people in that family, and they're just apoplectic that he's doing this. Uh, you can imagine. Uh, no labels. <laughs> I've talked to the people at the top. We had a Zoom very recently, and uh, we happened to have a good contact there as one of their main funders. So I think they were telling me the truth because he was on the Zoom. And it's, it's clear to me they don't have a clue what they're doing. They, they don't know exactly how they're going to organize this so-called convention or whatever they're, they're putting together. Uh, they may come up with a, with a ticket. And I can't analyze them till I know who they're running. I mean, it's not simply that they're on the ballot. It's like RFK Jr. You would think at first glance, well, that's going to hurt Biden. But uh, when you really look at the data, it wasn't true. Well, we had to see who they nominate first. And then we can decide who, uh, who they'll, they'll hurt and who they'll help, if anybody. You know, if they nominate some no name, I don't think it'll make much difference one way or the other. Okay, I think uh, that does it. And you want to... Get that QR code. This is free, by the way. The, the uh, crystal ball is free to anyone who has any connection to the University of Virginia, which means all of you. Now, how do I measure that? I don't. So absolutely anybody can do it, but we may investigate you at some time <laughs> or another, and then you will be taken off the list. But we've never done that, and nobody's been dropped. So I hope you'll, you'll uh, uh, help us out and uh, subscribe to the Crystal Ball and get informed. We send it out one, two, three times a week, depending on what's happening. And a lot's been happening lately. So we've been sending it out a lot. So uh, he who lives by the Crystal Ball ends up eating ground glass. I don't think I made any precise predictions. I've gotten better at that. Uh, but let me take some questions, and then we'll all go over and cheer and make sure that we break the streak and do the right thing. Got one back here. Uh, hi there. Uh, speaking of no labels, um, I know you can't analyze the ticket till they pick one, but what do you think, how many states do you think they'll be on the ballot if they do go forward with somebody? Well, they've got enough money to be on all 50 uh, that is pledged to them, and uh, some of them are, are quite wealthy, the backers. So I, if they really want to do it, I think they can be on all 50 or very close to all 50, so it can have an impact. On the other hand, they could end up taking about the same number of votes from each side, which is what Ross Perot did in 1992. He didn't really affect the ballots in the end, though I still say hurt Bush more because he started running and mainly attacked Bush throughout the whole campaign. So even though in the end he drew as many potential Clinton voters as Bush voters, he had lowered Bush uh, in, the, in the polls enough so that Clinton uh, had him because he was vulnerable to being defeated for other reasons too. But Perot was, was uh, you know, a fellow Texan was fighting a Texan. I used to say there's a, we needed a T-shirt. Uh, it's a Texas thing you wouldn't understand. Uh, and I never did fully understand it, other than jealousy. All right, who are you calling on? I'm not calling on people, so you all are doing it. Oh, he's got back. you got to get one of these people with the mics. That's, that's the power. I do not have any. They strip me of all power. Mr. Sabato. Uh, yes, sir. <clears throat> A comment, uh, Manchin could run as an independent, or he could flip to Republican. Uh, and, or he could uh, do a no labels with the uh, cinema of our Arizona. No. Anyway, my question is this. If you could change one amendment in our current Constitution, or 1A, 1B, 1C, as many as you want, what would you do? I, I am so glad. Did I pay you? Uh, <laughs> I, I wrote 
a book which was published in 2007 and a new updated edition in 2011 called A More Perfect Constitution. And I, uh, I, the subtitle was 23 Changes to Make Our Future Better. Uh, because, you know, it's an, it's an old document. <laughs> And it was written at a time where we didn't have the popular vote, and the franchise was extremely limited. Uh, and there were just loads of things that we don't deal with today, and loads of things that they couldn't have imagined back then. So it's time to update, which is what the founders wanted. They all wrote about this. Every generation should reexamine this and adapt it to uh, the circumstances existing in their time. And we have with amendments, but not really. 27, and, and a lot of them are, te after the first 10, they, that was part of the Constitution. So it's really 17 amendments over our history, and some of them are really minor, okay? And by the way, that I'm surprised you didn't know about it, because that book has had tremendous impact. Uh, zero of the 23 have been adopted. <laughs> but some of them are moving right along, and by the 22nd or 23rd century, I think some of them are gonna be in the document. Some of these, Young people might might live to see it. Now I know he doesn't have a mic, but I want this is the young man who's a uh, junior in uh, high school, right? Am I, freshman. Oh, freshman in high school. My God! Oh, the next president of the United States is right here once he becomes 35. All right, and give everybody your name so they can congratulate you. And you got a friend there too, who's yes. also in the same Hi, I'm class. Pierce. I wanted to ask Pierce. you about. Um, all Pierce well, Campbell. Now I remember it. Yes, you got the last name. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah, I'm an intern on um, Senator Donovan's campaign out in Henrico. But uh, with all the interest that um, Governor Yunkin is receiving for, um, in terms of running for president, do you think he'll run and do you think he could gain uh, considerable, support, considerable support in the primary? Well, that's a very good question. I wish I knew the answer. Uh, they've obviously been hinting and hinting and hinting and hinting, and uh, he's he's got so many pledges of money he'll have no problem on the money side uh, i kind of suspect he realizes what it would be like running against donald trump donald trump jr has already been softening him up if you i'm sure you all read truth social uh, and you read his tweets but among the trump people that that's like the bible they read all of trump's and all of trump jr's and all the rest and he's been going after uh youngkin pretty hard they call him another rhino Another rhino, Republican in name only. It's tough stuff, and uh, does he really wanna go through that, or does he wanna actually finish the term of the only office he's ever been elected to? Uh, and it, you know, in the old days, we called the governorship no higher honor. I remember those days, and clearly, um, it's not necessarily that anymore. Doug Wallner made the same mistake, running for president, and he became less popular on account of it. I've just, we had him here on, on Friday, and I asked him again about that, and he said, it's the dumbest thing I ever did. And uh, you may disagree, you know, there may be other dumb things that you wanna tell him about, but you write it. Uh, but it's not necessarily the best thing to do. Now, is there a path? Well, of course there's a path. He'd have to win both houses of the legislature in November. Uh, Trump would have to not collapse, but be seriously damaged in a way that, that Youngkin could capitalize on. Uh, and some of the other Republican candidates would either have to fade into oblivion or even endorse Yunkin. You're, you're not gonna beat Trump with, you know, five, six, seven people running against him. By the way, they all told me, because they did that in 2016, every senior Republican who was in office that I've talked to about this cycle early, early on said, well, don't you worry, we're not gonna make the same mistake we made in 2016. Remember they had, there were 17 candidates and the 17 split up 62% of the vote in the primaries. Donald Trump got 38% and won handily for the nomination. Not gonna make that mistake again. Well, they, didn't, they don't have uh, uh, 16 other candidates behind, uh, besides Trump, but they started out with eight or nine. Uh, so that's, you know, they did make the same mistake again because there are no bosses anymore. There are no party bosses anywhere. There was no one to go to those candidates and say, now listen, you're gonna help Trump again, you need to get out and wait, and you need to run as the imprimatur of the establishment, and you, no, uh-uh. There's nobody there to do it, and they weren't gonna listen anyway. So a lot, would, a lot of things would have to happen. Is it conceivable? Of course, of course it's conceivable. Is it likely? Not right now, it doesn't seem that way to me. 
Uh, but let's see what the results are of the elections in early November. And you're the one who's right in the middle of that, since you're working for Senator Donovan. Donovan is uh, the sister of uh, Ken Stolley, who was in the state senate for a long time, then sheriff of Virginia Beach. He just retired, and a good friend who was in the he was in the middle. He was he was somebody who could bring both sides together and get a compromise. If he'd been there. We wouldn't have had a deadlock on the budget for months after months after months. You need people like that who can bring both sides together. Same in Congress, and we, we just don't have them anymore, or there are not enough of them. Oh, oh okay. Hi. Hi. Um, I saw a presentation by Bob Woodward this summer, yeah. and one of the questions was uh, from the audience was whether they thought it would be end up being a Biden-Trump race, would it be a Biden-X race, or would it be a Trump-Y race? And he had said he had been speaking to some insiders in Washington, and he thought it would be an X and a Y race, so that neither one. Neither and I one. was kind of very excited about that, particularly given having seen some of the very strong female Democrats that are running states, traditionally red states, like the governor of Kansas, the governor of Michigan, and Wisconsin, and as well, well as Christine male Jordan. governor. So do you think there's any hope that we might have an X and Y race? And if so, what would it take for that to happen? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, for one thing, you have a much better memory than I do, because who's Bob Woodward? Uh, no. I. I remember having him we, to talk about Watergate at whatever anniversary it was. I've forgotten how, how many years it's been, but and he did very well on that. Uh, look, I don't know who he was talking about. I didn't ask him who X and Y were, and I suspect he didn't know either. Uh, and of course, it's still possible. Same answer I gave to, to uh, Pierce here. It's just not uh, uh, not a chance uh, that's big enough to bet on. But. Uh, it's a wild and woolly world anymore in American politics, and things happen that would never have happened in the old days. Most of the things that happened would never have happened in the old days. Um, by the way, if there's any role model for Yunkin, it would be uh, Wendell Wilkie. Now, at least half of you remember Wendell Wilkie from the 1940 race. Don't lie. <laughs> you were around, you remember, probably some of you worked in his campaign. <laughs> Don't lie. Don't lie. I, I was, I remember it, but I wasn't working in politics back then. But Wendell Wilkie, remember, came out of nowhere. He was a businessman, never been in public office, and managed to defeat a whole group of Republican office holders to get to be the Republican nominee for president. And for a while, he was really threatening FDR, in part because FDR was breaking the three, the uh, two-term limit, running for a third term. So you just never know. You know, strange things happen in politics that you can't imagine. Uh, so th how about that for a cloudy answer? That, my crystal ball is very cloudy, very misty, because it rained this morning. All right, now he, they have to, two more. Look, it's like they want to go to the game. I understand. Yeah, I think I'm on. Yeah, thank you, Larry, for a very interesting presentation. Thank my you. question was similar to what the lady, last lady asked. Because I, I know you mentioned a lot about the, the Republican candidates, but I was asking in your crystal ball, do you see any possible challenge to, to, to Biden? And earlier on you mentioned that you think that marginal seats is not a, such a good thing for the United States. But is it really such a bad thing so that, so that candidates could really fight you know, for, the, for the voters? Oh, I'm, the, I'm in favor of yeah, marginal yeah, okay. uh, races. For one thing, it keeps me in business. Okay, the more good. real races there are, the more I have to run my mouth about. Okay, all right, but I, I guess I could take your answer for the lady about your crystal ball for any possible yes, candidates. The, on, the fir on the first part. <laughs> thank you. Uh, no, thank you so much. On the first part, uh, you know, RFK dropped out. There's another one, Marianne Williamson. Enough said. Um, I'm not getting into it, but no, not a, not a serious challenger. Can there be somebody? Look, it would have to be a health issue, and and that is present for both Biden and, and Trump. You know, it is. Uh, Biden. I watch his. I watch him. I watch the speeches when I have time. I don't watch all of them, but the one yesterday, I was. I had the TV on, uh, and he to say he was stiff is to insult stiffness. Uh, you know, I mean, he could barely get those words out. And uh, now I've been told, and and I do believe this because there are people that I trust and have worked with for many years, and they say that his mind works much better than his body does. 
And, and I said, well, gee, that sounds like me. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, so that may be true. That may be true. But the image that he gives is of someone who is, is very old. And get, well, he's 80, uh, and he'll be 82 in the time of the election. But he, he just doesn't project the energy that a president should have. Now, Donald Trump projects too much energy. If only they could, you know, give each other something. But, uh, and Trump, look at Trump's diet. I'm sorry, but eating three Big Macs a day is not healthy. I hope I can tell you that. And the other stuff, I, I know a couple of his aides and the stuff they put on his plane between McDonald's and Kentucky Fried Chicken. Uh, I'm surprised the plane doesn't crash. You know, it's, this is not healthy. I'm not saying you can never have them or, or whatever. Though I am a uh, nearly lifelong vegetarian, and I'm morally superior to most of you. <laughs> yes. Okay, I got to be funny on this one now. Make make it easy well, for me to be funny. I'll make it easy on you because okay. I like you and I want to see you get ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kamala Harris. Mm -hmm. How big a liability is that for Biden because of what you just said, and the fact that Biden won't make it all the way through four years if he's elected. Well, I don't want to say somebody can't make it through. I want all of us to hit 100. I really do, particularly me. Uh, but I want everybody to hit 100. So I'm not going to say that, that he won't make it through, because people who have appeared very ill have lived a long time. I mean, you never know. But you're, you're right to mention her. And I didn't for various reasons. But you're going to see a lot of ads uh, during the general election saying, you may vote for him, image of Biden, but you're really voting for her image of Kamala Harris. And she's well below, uh, Biden's low in public approval. She's about 10 points below him. And so if people get that idea in their heads, which it is not hard to imagine it happening, even though I said I don't wish ill health on anybody for any reason, uh, but it's easy to imagine that might happen and she's unpopular. Uh, so it could, it could make a difference. You know, we, we're talking about a few thousand votes in a handful of states. Remember, Trump only lost the election in 2020. Really, he lost overall by seven plus million votes. He only lost by 45,000. Because in the key states that were close, it would have been enough to put him over the top in the electoral college, and they totaled 45,000 votes. So that's the electoral college system. Maybe good, maybe bad. I've told people for years, uh, you know, I don't want to see you waste your lives, so don't even try to change it, because it's not going to change. The small states are not going to permit it to change. Now, it is officially on the calendar. I've mentioned this to you before, for those who've been here. It's on the calendar. The Electoral College is going to dissolve on the 12th of never, see? So <laughs> remember that. Thank you, sir. That enabled, I got a tiny little laugh, but I'm so starved for it because of class. Thank you so much. Thank you all for joining us here live and also online. And on behalf of the Alumni Association and the Lifetime Learning Program, special thank you to Larry. Thank you so much. Uh, be sure to stop by the bookstore. They've got the Red Ripple here. And um, our next event is November 4th. We'll be talking about artificial intelligence. Have a good day. Speak of the devil, right?